All right. Good afternoon, PIF. Yeah, that was something. All right. Well, if we if we've never met before, my name is uh, Justin, and if uh, if we haven't, I'd love for us to uh, speak after service and get to know one another in any kind of way. Uh, but if you're coming in for the first time or the first time at least, if you missed last week, uh, we are in the midst of a series called "The Questions of Jesus," and uh, we're in the second week now. Uh, but before I kind of dive in more into the series itself, I actually wanted to start our time off together with a bit of a story, and it's from uh, if you've ever heard this folk, uh, it's a German folk tale from the 1800s uh, written by the notorious brothers Grimm and it's a story called The Fisherman and His Wife and as you might imagine it's a story about a fisherman and his wife and they were very poor and they lived in a very raggedy hut but if you asked the fisherman he was totally okay with his conditions he couldn't be bothered for more but his wife was a different story where she want, she always seemed to not be satisfied with her condition and so she always felt wanting for more now, one day on his da- to go on his daily catch, the fisherman went out to the sea to go get one because he was uh, in a remote village by the sea. And on his way there, he kind of just felt like it was going to be another day until he went out to get his catch. And on the line was a talking flounder. It was a magic flounder. And, on, and when, he, when, he, when he reeled it in, the flounder speaks to him saying, I'm an enchanted prince. It's in your best interest to release me. If you even try to eat me, I promise I won't even taste good. And so, again, the fisherman, all he wanted to do was fish and eat his fish. And so what he did was just release the fish thinking he had no use. No, there was no bother to take this fish home. When he went back home to talk with his wife, because they didn't have social media back then, so when you're home, you actually talk with your family. They did this, and so they talked with one another, and he was recapping his day. He's like, oh, yeah, you know what? I did my thing. Went to to go fish again, caught a fish. It talked, by the way. And the wife cuts him off, like, whoa, 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 what do you mean the fish talked? He's like, yeah, it was was like enchanted and something. You said it was a prince or whatever, but I just let him go because, like, you know, we can't eat a talking fish. That's inhumane. And the wife cuts him off and says, you can ask that fish for a wish. You could have, like, you don't see our condition right now, and you think that you, we don't, you know, you couldn't ask anything for this fish. Go back right now and ask for a better cottage than the one that we're living in right now. Now, like I mentioned before, the fisherman couldn't be bothered to, for more things, but all that he wanted to do was satisfy his wife's needs because he recognized that her lifestyle that she desired couldn't be fit by, through, or through his means. And so he goes back to the sea and goes to ask the flounder, and he gives actually this wish, as you might see on the screen here. And he says, O man, O man, if man you be, or flounder, flounder in the sea. Such a tiresome wife I've got, for she wants what I do not. Now I promise that's not the, the words of my own, because my wife is wonderful. She's not tiresome. That's how great my wife is. But just to translate this, as we keep it up for a little bit, in plain English. I don't care if you're a man. I don't care if you're a fish. I don't care if you're a man fish. But whoever or whatever you are, can you grant my wish so that my wife can get off my back? As I said before, the fisherman just did not care for a better lifestyle. But he's he's developed this dire need, not for what he's actually asking for, but to satisfy his wife. Because he's finding more and more that his wife has an insatiable desire for more. And so he goes, and so his present need outweighed who he was actually asking, and he was just that desperate to do so. I mention this story because as Christians, I really believe that we are in a similar boat where we learn that when we have a need, pray about it. When you're, when you have, when you're praying, close your eyes, furrow your eyebrows, raise your shoulders, put out your hands like this, slap in Jesus' name at the end, and then boom, just wait for God to manifest Jesus through the heavens and the earth and wait for him to manifest from the heavenly planes like the genie from the bottle in Aladdin. Now, I think that's a little bit mean-hearted in some kind of ways, but we have to understand that we can confess that in a lot of ways we've come before Jesus just like how the fishermen came before the fish. We are asking him, whoever you are, whatever you are, whatever you can do for me, please grant my wish. You're my only hope. Now, in maybe some ways, that, that's what we've been taught to do and ta- the way we've been taught to think. But in a lot of ways, this Jesus that we've constructed in our minds is nothing more than a magic fish. One that we can just go out and just expect to do many things. And we get pleasantly surprised if he does do the things that we want him to do. And then thoroughly disappointed if he doesn't do what we want him to do. 
I think because of that, there's a bit of a disconnect here. And I think, you know, we're in a culture nowadays where a lot of people are disconnected from God. And, expl- and this can maybe explain a bit a, 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 a part of it. And frankly speaking, if you know someone who feels this way, or maybe you yourself over time have come before God with some, you know, spiritual, physical, emotional, mental, social need, and you came with full trust and faith that the giver will give and the healer would heal, and you were met with silence, perhaps your disappointment can be warranted. But I also can kind of guarantee that our disappointment is frankly not because we're, we're going to the Jesus that I know and the Jesus that many of you know and the Jesus that we serve, but frankly speaking, it's because we have a misplaced faith in the wrong Jesus. So I think it's timely then that as we are in the second week of our Questions of Jesus sermon series, the second question today that we're going to ask is this question. Who do you say that I am? We've talked before through that Jesus asked questions to his disciples to investigate and to, and through discussion, ask, just develop a deeper longing and deeper understanding of the things unknown. And so Pastor June last week brought this message on uh, what do you want me to do for you? A very vulnerable question. But when Jesus asks his disciples uh, this question today in our reading that we're about to read, There's a vulnerability there that there's a paradigm shift starting to form where we have a preconceived notion, even if you don't think that you do, even if you've been youth grouped your way up to this point of your life, and you feel like you know the Jesus and the God that preachers have been preaching at your face for years and years and years, we can look at the reflections of our lives and see that perhaps that's not the case. And so today, we're going to read from Mark chapter 8 to start to get a better picture, a fuller picture of what Jesus means uh, when he asks this question. So if you can and you are able to, can I actually ask us to rise at this time? Uh, we're going to read from Mark 8 uh, uh, with me. So you, if you could turn to your Bibles there, uh, or it's Mark, 20, uh, Mark 8 verses 27 and on. I will also have it on the screens to my left and to my right. Um, so you, it will be available for your reading there. Okay. But it reads in verse 27, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? So Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Amen. You may be seated at this time. So this is a very uh, uh, this is the beginning of a very, a very well known passage. We'll read more in just a bit. But before we dive in, I think it's important that we understand the context around what's happening here. Because uh, in the first half of Mark chapter eight, here we're seeing two miraculous events in Jesus' ministry that comes uh, that leads to our story today. The first is the feeding of the four thousand, not to be confused with the five. And the second, just before today's reading, is the healing of a blind man at Bethsaida. Now, I'm not going to investigate too deeply into either of those happenings, but what's important for us is here is that we're seeing Jesus have a multitude of hats that he's wearing just in those two stories. And if you, if you went to your small groups or anything at this moment and you asked, what's one miracle that Jesus did? All of us can probably come together and make a collage of at least a dozen public miracles that Jesus did. But the two mentioned here is very important because neither of them are really that much alike. The feeding of the 4,000 is a perfect example, just like the one with the 5,000, where Jesus is a great provider. Where he takes just a couple of loaves of bread, no fish in the story either, just a couple of loaves. And with it, he blesses it and he's able to feed 4,000 with even baskets left over of food. And then in the, in the passage about the healing of the blind man, he becomes not the provider, but at that moment, the great healer, where the man was able to see, like some things that he was never able to conceive before with his physical eyes, he was given eyes to see. But this is important because when Jesus begins today's reading with the question to his disciples, uh, mind you, who do people say that I am? He's not asking them. He's asking what the disciples think others are saying about him. They're saying, some think you're Elijah, some think you're John the Baptist, some think that you're just a prophet. And those are fine answers, but I think this is important because Jesus knowingly asked that question. Again, he's never foolish. He's never disingenuous when he asks these questions. He has a plan. 
And in asking this question, he knew there wouldn't be one answer. Because like the fish was just a means of provision for the fishermen in that moment, Jesus knew that he would be whatever people coming to him would need him to be. Continuing on with our folktale from before, after the fisherman made his request, the fish actually indeed did uh, you know, grant his wish. So the fisherman went back to his home, and now it was a nice sparkling cottage. And so he and his wife were like giddy and dancing around and super happy about the fact that they got this nice, nice place. But then the wife comes together at that moment and says, if he could grant us this house, what's stopping him from granting us more? I got it. Ask for a bigger house. So he goes back and asks for a bigger house, and he comes back, and now they're in a castle. So then he comes back home, and they're doing the dance, and they're so happy again. And so she says, you know what, though? I like this castle. Why, does, why don't you go ask the fish to make me king? Yes, king, not queen, by the way, king. And so she's like, yeah, that, so he, that's great. So he went back and started to ask the fish to make her king. So indeed, she became king. So when he went back, he was like, yeah, this is, isn't this everything that we ever wanted? He said, you know what, though? Why don't I become the emperor? And afterwards, this whole cycle continues, and she even asks to be the pope. Now, if you know anything about Germany in the 1800s, if you were both emperor and pope, you're the head of church and state. You're everything. You're at the very peak of society. You're, you're pretty much the A, the A1 human in all of, uh, of Western Europe at that time. And so the, the fisherman who couldn't be bothered for more was reluctantly doing all this just to please his wife while his wife was always seeking more and more. But even after having all that, she still wasn't satisfied. So she says to go back to the fish and ask for one more thing, to be just like God. So he goes and he asks to make his wife just like God. And the fish gets enraged, a storm brews, thunder claps, lightning strikes, and everything that the fish had granted to this couple was taken away from them, never to be seen again. Now, why I mentioned this story overall with the fisherman and his wife is that one, there's, a good, there's a sermon of attitude of gratitude in here somewhere. That's for another time, probably Thanksgiving, right? But the pattern of greed that developed here is an important thing to understand because the wife fell into this myth of more. She thought that having more would change her and change her dissatisfaction. But what she didn't understand was that a change of circumstance won't change her. A change of heart will. And I think what's coming up, up, up here is why Jesus then, coming back to our story, why Jesus always after a public miracle, no matter what, feeding the 4,000, feeding the 5,000, healing the blind man, water into wine, all these things, there's a trend where Jesus vows all the witnesses to silence and then retreats into the quiet place afterwards. We might call this a humble king moment with Jesus, and that's true. But one thing that Jesus knew about every single person here is that he understood the fickleness of the human condition. He knew that his miraculous deeds would be the, the talk of the town and everyone would hear. And this is important because I hear every single time. I don't get to go out that often these days because I, I have two kids now. But I hear the moment of a nice new halal car comes into the city, everyone's already lining up around the block, coiling three times just to get it. So it, just imagine that. And then suddenly, a guy could make people see. A guy could make someone walk. A guy could heal someone from the dead. Are you kidding me? So everyone's going to storm him like he's a celebrity. We know something about that. So what we have to understand here then is he's trying to avoid this, uh, this understanding. Because get this. When we have a miracle happen to us, we'll be more grateful for the miracle than the giver. Something happened to me in my own life as well where several years ago when I was in this church, uh, actually I was at a retreat and uh, coming back from that retreat, I was wonked out because that's what we do. We don't sleep and we're tired the next three days afterwards. I was coming down, I used to live in a third floor walk up and I was so wonked out the next morning that I missed the step and I fractured my left ankle. Now, that is, that's great and all, but then I remember, but just two weeks later, I happened to be in a class, we happened to be talking about divine healing, and in a very scoff manner, I was like, okay, fine, why don't we try this? And in a blink, and in a snap, I was able to do bunny hops, one leg squats, and all, all the like. It was a divine healing. And for a moment, I was like walking on cloud nine with, the, with God, until for a long while after that, all I could talk about was, look what happened. 
Look what happened. Look what happened. And we made it such a big deal that I got healed. But at that moment, I forgot the great giver. In that same moment, when something happens to us, when we attribute it to God, we can say, look what the great giver has given. Look what the great healer has healed. Look at what the great redeemer has redeemed. And we forget about the great giver in the first place. We forget that in every single moment that in his grace, God is fully capable and always willing to give to people in need. As long as it's in accordance with his will. And so as a side note, if you at this moment have been pressing in and pressing in about a need, and you've been coming to God for a long while about something that you just are in dire need of, keep pressing. But at the same time, if it's been so long and nothing's happening, maybe change the source. I'm just saying. But anyway, I think it's important that we understand the goodness of God because what's important for us and our, our purpose is here then is the question that Jesus asked in this passage today. And it's again, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am is such an important question because it's, as it's in typical Jesus style, he uses a Socratic method to almost ask you a question, not for you to answer, but to you to learn more about yourself. When he asks, who do you say I am, it starts to vet between those who are passive recipients of his grace or those who are active disciples of him. Jesus asks questions again to invoke a deeper discovery of, tr- uh, discovery of deeper truth and to provoke a paradigm shift. So this is really important for us to de- uh, dive deep into because he's asking you this question as well. Who do you say I am? Are you just a willy-nilly person who's grateful for all the things he gives? Or are you going to be a disciple of me? When he's asking his disciples in today's passage, then the first person to respond is Peter. It's always Peter. Good old Peter. More on him in a second. But understand, when he answers this question with this answer, you are the Messiah. Please understand that this is loaded. Loaded. The term for Messiah in the Hebrew, and I want you to spit into this one, Mashiach, right? Mashiach is the, is the way you say it in Hebrew. And by the way, that's Christos in Greek. So if you thought Christ was his last name, like him is mine, no. It's, Christ means the anointed one, right? He's not Jesus Hong. He's not Jesus Kim. He's Jesus, he's Jesus Christ because that's his title. Now, this is important because what the prophecy would say of the Old Testament, that the Messiah would be of the line of King David, and he would be the savior and the liberator of the Jewish people. And this is important for a lot of people to understand because the Jews in the second temple period, that's from the Babylonian uh, captivity that's around Daniel's time, all the way to Jesus' present time, they were constantly in the hands of captors. They were in the hands of the Babylonians, the Assyrians, and all the way to the Greeks and now the Romans. So they were always second-class citizens in their own nation. And so for years and years and generations after generations, their own customs, their own beliefs, their own ability to pray were stripped of them, which is paralyzing since the Jews were God's chosen people. But they still believed. They still believed that a Messiah would come. They still believed the Savior would come. They still believed that so much that they wrote letters to one another, assuring one another that better days are ahead. And why? What could they possibly hope for so much that they believed in that? That a Messiah was coming. So it's no accident then that we come back to today's reading. And the first person to address Jesus himself was Peter. Now, Peter was kind of that guy. Peter was like, if you need me to call you what, I, what you want me to call you, I'll call you that. If you want me to jump in the sea, I'll jump in there. If you need me to chop someone's ear off, I got you. He was that guy. And he saw everything. From the moment he dropped his net and followed Jesus to this very moment, he saw miracle after miracle. He was the inside guy of inside guys. And so if anyone had reason, credible belief to follow Jesus and call him the Messiah, it was Peter. Except Peter had a fatal flaw. One that, frankly, I think I find myself having a lot too. And it was rash behavior. He never thought before he acted and he never thought before he spoke. That's why every single time you see Peter, when he, when he jumps into the sea, he, he, he falls into the water. He chops the guy's ear off, Jesus puts it right back. Van Gogh could never. Right? And so we have all those kinds of things where we believe that Peter was rash in those things. But he still said, you are the Messiah. So Jesus took that and ran with it. And so he says the next piece, which is very vital for us as Christians to believe in. Let's read from verse 31 at this time. 
And Jesus says here, to be, he, well, Jesus, says to, uh, Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Imagine that. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. This is where we see Peter's mistake. I feel like we, a lot of us use verse 33 or like your parents must have used it one time when you decided to wear shorts to church. And you're like, you do not know the mind of God and you're only with human concerns and all those things. But this isn't a legalism platform. Peter's mistake was every Jew's mistake in that they all wanted Jesus to be more than what he just promised to be. When Jesus promises them and t- foretells his own death and resurrection, they're like, where are you going? Why did I leave my job for you? Why did I leave my family for you if you're going to die? Every Jew at that time started to get a radicalized idea of who the Messiah was. As I said before, the Messiah was meant to be a savior and a redeemer of his people. But after years of captivity became generations of oppression, we understand that there's starting to be a fantasy of who the Messiah is. And so there's this whole stigmatism, there's this fanaticism growing around the Messiah and the person that he'll be. If anyone ever grew up with a Chuck Norris joke and he's like, you know, Chuck Norris is so buff that he could punch it with his beard and you'll die. Kind of one of those things, you know. And in the same way, what happened with Jesus here is that the mo- he comes in a meek form. He comes in a modest, humble body. And he's saying he's going to die. So at that moment, he, they weren't, he wasn't the military leader that they were expecting. So when Jesus says that Peter doesn't have the, you know, in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns, he's actually condemning Peter, who said he's a disciple, who called Jesus the Messiah for not understanding the bigger picture. Let's keep reading. Verse 34, and then he called, that is Jesus, the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? I think where this boils down to the modern day and for all of us in this room at this time is that Jesus in this passage, in these verses right here, categorizes all of mankind into two groups. One is the passive recipient of grace. One is the active disciple. One is the one who wants to save their life, their earthly life. And the one is the one who wants to lose it for Jesus. Now, frankly speaking, a lot of us teeter this line because if you talk about the former, if we talk about the passive recipients of grace, there is a there's a doctrine out there called uh, com- the doctrine of common grace. And the doctrine of common grace teaches that God has always bestowed his graciousness on all people in all parts of the earth at all times, no matter their standing with him. So no matter what, anybody at any time can wistfully go into any uh, setting and get their desires to be true. That's why I'll, I watch a lot of shows these days, and when you need to get into your, co- your dream college, you need to get your dream job, you need to get your dream girl, you're always going to like a, like a Buddhist temple, or you could go to a tarot card reader, or you wish upon a star. You, know? like you do anything possible to get it, and you can kind of serendipitously say that my dream came true. But the point here is not the fact that those not of God won't be able to ask and receive their needs. The point here is that the passive recipients of God miss out on the great, are too focused rather on the great giver's gifts and not focused on the giver. They miss out then on the secrets of heaven that Jesus in his earthly time bestows upon his disciples. Look again what verse 36 says. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? I see a lot of young, like not everybody obviously, but I see a lot of younger folk in this crowd today. So it's hard for a lot of us to imagine death on its deathbed. 
But this image, this verse, to me, protrudes this image of someone who climbed to the very height of society. Like the woman in the, in, in the story was both emperor and pope. We get to the height of society only to realize that you can't take your power, prestige, and possessions with you to the grave. This actually reminds me of actually something that the late great uh, Steve Jobs, co-founder, CEO of you know, app, of uh, CEO of Apple, uh, you know, a 3.5 trillion dollar company. If you've ever heard of it, right? And he says something on his deathbed to uh, to this uh, something like this: At this moment, lying on the bed, sick and remembering all my life, I realize that all my recognition and wealth that I have is meaningless in the face of imminent death. One can find material things, but there is one thing that I cannot, be, that cannot rather be found when it is lost, life. He's absolutely right. Bro, I, see, I don't imagine that Steve Jobs, the name most synonymous with consumer capitalism in the modern day, is like any kind of a preacher or any type of a Christian. But brother's preaching right here when he's, talking, when he's saying this here. Listen, what he's saying is when we're all running this rat race, I, Mr. Jobs with my kind of bald head and my black turtleneck, made it to the summit of society. I'm, in, I'm still in your pockets right now. You're, uh, you're, writing, you're reading your sermon off of me right now. That's what he did. And on his deathbed, one who did not even give his life to Christ, he's recognizing that the rat race of life still is not worth it. But nonetheless, nonetheless, even as a preacher, I feel guilty of saying that I myself find myself guilty of often thinking very much like our, our folktales fisherman's wife today. Because it's very easy to feel dissatisfied with what I've got today. Now, I'm not living in a cottage, and I'm not living in, I'm not, I'm, I don't fish for life. But what happens is, we still find every moment to be dissatisfied with what we got. And so when we come to church, someone evangelizes and someone tells me that Jesus is a prince of peace. Someone is a, he's a liberator. He's, he promises love, grace, and mercy to all those who come to him. I'm already finding like my, I already found my meal ticket. He becomes my magic flounder in that moment. And so like Peter, I start to get these promises and I start to make it my own fantasies. I'm not exempt. Some of you may not have known, but about six weeks ago, my wife, I messed this up in the first, uh, mess, um, first time, so I'm not going to do it this time. My only wife, <laughs> my only wife gave birth to my second child, a son uh, uh, that came and he, uh, on May 24th. So it's been a long six, seven weeks, as you may imagine. Now, that's, that's, the point isn't to talk about that, though, because even this past week, I found myself at 3 a.m. in my delirium dealing with my fussy son. There, there, buddy goo goo gaga buddy and doing whatever I can to, to cheer him up and nothing was working and so in that moment in my despair and in my delusion honestly I asked Jesus to make my life easier and by the way that's not my idea of Jesus taking his crane arm and throwing him out the trash but my idea was more just whatever it takes to calm this guy down I was even laying my hands like a preacher I would I lay my hands on his head and just try to pray the annoying away but it wasn't working in fact once I put my, my large hand on his small head on, uh, he started, started crying even more and nothing was working. And I felt like everything was caving around me. And trust me, if you've ever had a kid at that time of day, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but nonetheless, I paused and realized at that moment, God, like what, is that, what does this make me? How does this make me any different than the fisherman and his wife in my tale today? Am I just another one of those people who just go to Jesus as my backup guy? When I need something in my times of despair, do I just go to him in those moments? And in that moment, perhaps it was because I was working on this passage for like, like several weeks at this point, And I was just saturating this passage. But at that moment, I hear a still small voice come to my mind. Something that just penetrated my core and my heart at that exact moment. It was Jesus, and he was asking me this question. Who do you say I am? Now, at first, I honestly felt remorse, funny enough, when he asked that question. Because like I mentioned before, this question is reserved for disciples. And a lot of times, I feel very much like Peter. I don't feel like a disciple. I don't feel like I'm doing things right. I feel like I only go to Jesus when I need something, and he only becomes my backup guy when I need something desperately. 
Like Peter, I have fantasies about how it should be, things that God should do for me to make my life perfect. And so I kind of get stuck in this mindset. And so I, even in, the, in, in a frozen moment, all I could do like Peter was come before God and say, yes, sir, you are Messiah, you are Father, you are Omega, you are Alpha, you are all these things. I was just doing this whole like r- religious dance with him. But there was still silence at that moment. Suddenly, I'm looking at my, my even, even fussier son at that point. And something in my soul then started to cry out. Something that a name, a, a name could not be assigned to. And all I could say at that moment, maybe it was because I didn't even believe it at that moment. I replied, you are enough. Beyond what more you could do for me, beyond any idea of happiness that I can construe, beyond any faculty of my mind. You are enough. And at that moment, I get, an, I get this image of a cross on Calvary. And at first, Jesus was on it, and I was in despair. But right afterwards, I get that same image of the cross, and it was empty. And then another voice comes and says to pick it up and follow me. As I invite the worship team up at this time, I want to give us this, or this question here again. Because disciples of Christ, you did not waste your time on a Sunday or even throughout your week for you to not be called a disciple of Christ. In this moment, when we clear out all the clutter of noise, when we clear out the distractions of our lives, when we continuously, st- when we just stop talking for a bit and stop coming before God with all these pleas and all these desires and all these requests, for a moment, he says, my turn. Who do you say I am? I believe that Jesus is coming here to remind us of what it means to be a disciple. And honestly, that means, as he says in the passage, to deny ourselves. And to deny ourselves of what it's supposed to look like. Deny ourselves of what our dreams are. Deny ourselves of what it's supposed to, what our expectations are. Deny ourselves of thinking that we can do it on our own. Denying any idea and machination of what we think the gospel is. At the moment, we must deny it all. As Paul says in Philippians 1 verse 21, to live is Christ. To die is gain. He's asking us today, church, who do you say I am? He's not coming to a crowd, but he's coming into that still small voice, that quiet space with you. And he's asking, who do you say I am? Because this isn't a question that your neighbor could answer. And this isn't the question for the crowd to answer. But as I invite us to rise at this time, this is only something that you can answer.